Thank you so much, Anna, for this uh, opportunity. And thank you, everyone, for coming into my lecture. So today, I will talk to you about how to make large language models faster and make them cheaper to serve uh, using a technique called quantization. And specifically, I'm going to talk about weight and KV cache quantization. So at this point, you're probably already familiar with large language models. Um, you have used ChatGPT, maybe you have heard or run Llama before. And one trend of these large language models is that, is that they're scaling up in size um, very rapidly. So a few years back, we have a few hundred millions of parameters in the BERT model. And then um, a few years past, we have GPT-1, GPT-2, which are like scaling up towards the billion scale. And now we have these really humongous uh, models that are uh, up to trillions of uh, parameters in size. Um, so one conclusion is that large language models are scaling up in size to improve the performance because we have seen that transformer models are really good when it comes to um, model size to performance ratio. Um, one problem is that since they are scaling up so much in size, they become more and more expensive to serve uh, due to the limited size of GPU memory. As an example, the recent Llama 370B model requires at least 170 gigabytes of GPU memory or two A180 gigabyte GPUs to serve. Um, and even more astonishingly, Llama 345B, which is 405 billion parameters, requires at least a thousand gigabytes or one terabyte of GPU memories in total. Uh, that is 16 H180 gigabytes. Um, so how are these numbers calculated? So I'm going to teach you a trick to roughly calculate the GPU memory requirement for your model. Um, so if you take the model size in billions, uh, so for example, 70B, so that's 70 in billion, and you times two, and then times 1.2, that's approximately how much GPU memory it requires in gigabytes. Uh, so why does this calculation work, right? Uh, so the large language models, they have their parameters stored in BF16 or FP16, which is two bytes per parameter. Uh, that's why you times two. And then the 1.2 is for the working memory. For example, storing the KV cache, storing the intermediate products, the intermediate tensors. Um, so you need some uh, headspace to work with those intermediate products. Um, so that's the calculation for you. So model size times two times 1.2, that's amount of GPU memory required to serve a model. Um, so today I will, I will talk in depth about quantization. Um, so let me give you an overview of quantization and why it is interesting. So as we have established, large language models are very expensive to serve and run inference for. Um, and quantization essentially makes them cheaper and faster. So how does quantization do that, right? Um, so quantization has mainly two benefits. Um, it makes the models require less memory to serve. And also they are faster in inference. Um, so quantization essentially works by converting the floating point parameters into integer format, uh, which are more compact in memory. That's why it requires less memory. Uh, and quantization makes the model faster because there is less memory bottleneck because we are reading less memory from the GPU memory. And, and uh, because the model size is smaller, we can use a less number of GPU to serve the same model. So there's less GPU communication. Um, so these two factors contribute to the quantized models being faster. Uh, for example, uh, if you think about Llama 3.145b, in the original 16-bit precision, it requires 16 80 gigabyte GPUs uh, or two nodes to run inference for. While if you run the 4-bit quantized version, it can be run on eight GPUs, each with 48 gigabytes of GPUs memory. 
which makes it significantly cheaper and faster. Is there is there a question? Uh, no, I just I'm gonna check everyone is muted. All right, yes. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so how does quantization work? Uh, quantization reduces the precision of model weights. Uh, for example, the BF16 is a floating point format and uh, we can quantize it into int eight, so eight bit integers. Uh, and during inference, the quantized integer weights are dequantized on the fly back into the floating point format because we cannot just do the multiplication in integer format. We have to convert them back into the floating point format and then do the matrix multiplications. Um, so as you probably already know, the, the model weights, uh, the brain of the model is stored in floating point format. And model inference is essentially, essentially uh, a lot of matrix multiplications. Uh, and on the bottom left here, we have the original weights of the model, which is in 32-bit as an example. And then during the quantization, we convert them into these A-bit integers. Um, these A-bit integers are four times more storage efficient than the 32-bit uh, floating point numbers. Um, however, we cannot do the model inference with these A-bit integers. Um, so during inference, Inside the GPUs, what we do is we convert them back in a process called dequantization into 32-bit floating point numbers. Uh, there is some loss of precision if we compare the reconstructed weights on the right with the original weights on the left. Um, however, this loss of precision does not contribute much to the model errors, and you retain the original model performance while being much more memory efficient. Uh, that's the basic idea of quantization. And now let's do an example. Uh, let's dive in deeper into quantization and see how it actually works. Oh, first, let's talk about how floating point numbers are represented inside a computer. Um, so the floating point numbers, we usually use 16 bits or 32 bits to represent them. And it's stored in a scientific notation. So on the left here, we have plus minus fraction times 10 to the exponent. And uh, this is how we represent a floating point number in scientific notation. And it's also how it is essentially stored on a computer inside a memory. Uh, so we have different floating point number formats on the right. So BF16, FP32, FP16. Uh, they are pretty similar, except that we use different number of bits to represent the exponent in the fraction. Uh, so we can represent a different range of numbers with uh, these floating point formats. Uh, and the most common format that we use to store large language model weights is currently BF16. It used to be FP32 for BERT models, uh, but now in the age of large language models, we're using BF16. Um, so you might be asking, if LM parameters are mostly commonly stored as BF16, how can be how can they be represented as integers in a quantized matrix? So let's first take a look at uh, a fine quantization or linear quantization. Uh, in a fine quantization, what you need to do is you need to store the scaling point, sorry, the scaling factor and the zero point for a group of weights. Uh, I'll dive into why this is needed later. Uh, but essentially, you want to map the original x, the original weights, into q, the quantized representation of the same weights. Uh, and you map them through, uh, through two numbers, uh, scaling factor and zero point. So scaling factor is calculated uh, according to this equation, q max minus q min, over x max minus x min. Um, so q max and q min is dependent on how many bits of quantization you're doing. Uh, for example, if you use 8-bit quantization, then you have 256 available values to represent. 
Uh, so Q max will be 255 and Q min will be zero. And X, X max and X min is determined by uh, the group of weights you're quantizing. Um, and essentially it is the max number and the min number of a group of weights. And the zero point uh, is Q min minus the rounded uh, scaling factor times the X min. And then we also have the equation for uh, computing the quantized value and dequantized value. Uh, let's do an example to see how this works. So let's first assume that we're doing four big quantization with a group size of four. Uh, okay, with this assumption in mind, let's take a look at this weight matrix. Uh, this weight matrix is a is 16 weights in 32-bit flow. And we want to quantize it to four-bit integers with a group size of four. So what that means is that we take four numbers because this is a group and we have a group size of four. We have, okay, we take these four numbers and we compute the scaling factor in the zero point according to these two equations. Um, so what we do is we take the Q max. What's the Q max? Q max is two to the four minus one because we can represent 16 values with four-bit quantization. Uh, okay, so two to the four minus one minus uh, Q min, which is zero, and then over X max, which is the maximum value in the current group, which is 2.52, uh, and the minimum number, which is um, negative 1.12. So X max minus X min, and then you end up with 4.12. Uh, and now we have calculated a scaling factor for a group. And then let's now take a look at zero point. Zero point is the Q min, Q min is zero in this case, minus the rounded scaling factor times the X min. X min is the uh, value negative 1.12. Uh, and at the end, you arrive at our scaling factor 4.12 and the 0 0.5 for the current group of weights. Okay, now we have obtained the scaling factor in the zero point. We can now compute the quantized values for this group of weights. Um, and it is computed as Q equals to rounded S, uh, S times X plus Z, uh, S being the scaling factor and zero being the zero point. Um, so if you do this calculation, for example, 2.52 times 4.12, plus five, and then you run that, and you end up with 15. Um, as you can see here, the maximum number is represented by the maximum quantized value, which is 15 in four-bit quantization, and the minimum number in the weights is represented by the minimum value, which is zero in the quantized value. Uh, so we essentially map the original weights into a quantized number line. Um, which is between zero and 15 for four big quantization. Uh, so after we have quantized the weights into integers, during inference, we cannot use the integers to run inference by themselves. We have to dequantize into the full precision weights before we can do the matrix multiplication, right? And you compute the dequantized value through this equation, Q minus Z divided by S. And we already have the scaling factor in zero point for the current group. So we just plug in the equation and we get the dequantized value as shown here. Uh, so 2.18. Uh, so there is some loss of precision that occurring here. So we go from 2.52 to 2.18 and we go from negative 1.12 to negative 1.21. So there is some loss of precision in the model ways. And that's a unavoidable trade-off in quantization. Um, you lose precision because you are using less number of, uh, less amount of information to represent more information. So it is a lossy compression technique. So you're always going to lose some information in the process. Uh, but this is actually okay because quantization 
usually achieves the best size to accuracy trade-off in large language models, which is a very interesting observation and it is thoroughly examined in this paper called the case for four bit precision k bit inference scaling loss. Uh, I highly recommend checking out this paper if you are interested. Uh, so what this paper is telling us is that if you quantize the model from 16 bit to a low bit width, such as three bit and four bit, uh, what you'll find is that the accuracy on a downstream task is usually achieved by the smallest size at four bit quantization. So four bit quantization is usually the best when it comes to size and accuracy trade-off. Um, so as we have uh, established, the loss of precision in the quantized parameter lead to worse performance in, uh, in the quantized model than the full model. Um, but the four bit quantized models usually offer be the best size to accuracy trade-off. Um, yeah, it's in this paper. If you want to check it out, you can, uh, you should definitely check it out. So that was uh, uniform quantization, which maps um, the original values into a number line of quantized values, which are evenly spaced out. Can I ask and a question? Sorry to interrupt, um, but since you're moving to another type of quantization, uh, could you walk us again, if you have already done so, uh, about um, intuition for the equations that you have used to produce the uh, integer versions of these 32-bit float numbers. So yeah, here these equations scale factor zero mm -hmm. point. Whoever introduced them, uh, how did they come to these equation? Why these uh, exactly? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so I think the intuition behind it is that you want to minimize the amount of reconstruction error uh, when you dequantize the quantized value back into full precision. Uh, and the way to do that is that um, you determine the range of the full precision parameters and then you evenly space out the quantized value across the range of the of the dynamic range of the full precision values uh, so that you ensure that each parameter is at least represented by some quantized value in its neighborhood. Um, and the scaling factor in zero point is determined by the min and max of the current group of the parameters. So it's dependent on the min and max of the current parameters. Um, and I think that's a very important insight is that uh, the min and max determines the range of the parameters. And if you assume the parameters are uniformly distributed, um, there will be pretty well represented by a quantized value in its neighborhood. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if that that's a good explanation. Um, let me know if you want me to give it, more it, insights. It makes sense, thank you. I'll just check whether there are any other questions from the students. Seems good on our side, thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we have uh, seen uniform quantization. Let's talk about non-uniform quantization. Um, so a very recent work in non-uniform quantization is called Squeeze LLM. Um, you, you can check out the paper if you want. It's, uh, it, the title is right here. Um, so non-uniform quantization is pretty different from uniform quantization in that it doesn't use the min and max to determine the range of quantization. It looks at the highly sensitive values of uh, the weights and then performs clustering to determine the optimal quantized value uh, for a group of weights. Um, so on the in the illustration here on the right, so the green lines are uh, the green lines on the top are the uh, original precision original precision parameters. Um, and then the red values are the top most sensitive values. So you want to preserve these sensitive values. Uh, on the bottom here, uh, the green lines are the uh, uniform quantization quantized values. Um, as you can see here, 
these uniform quantized values, they don't preserve the sensitive values. Um, by preserving the sensitive values, you are preserving the model quality and the model performance. So what they did is they use a set of uh, sensitivity aware, non-uniform quantized values to better fit the most sensitive values in the model ways in order to preserve the model performance or the model accuracy. Um, and these sensitivity aware, non-uniform quantized values, since they're non-uniform, they will have to use a lookup table to store the quantized values uh, in the GPU. And they do dequantization in this way uh, on the fly to do model inference. Um, so here is an illustration of uh, uniform versus non-uniform quantization. So on the left here, we have uniformly spaced out quantized values. Uh, and when you have an input X, you do scaling and rounding and then inverse scaling to obtain the output X, which is, which is quantized X hat. Um, and then on the right, we have non-uniform quantization uh, where the quantized values are uh, non-uniformly spaced out. And then when we are feeding an input X, uh, we need to look up the quantized value from the lookup table in order to reconstruct the X hat, which is the dequantized values. There is a question in the chat. Uh, what makes the values sensitive? That uh, was unclear. OK, thank you for the question. So what makes the values sensitive um, there is an observation in large language models um, is that uh, different knowledge is encoded by different weights. And some weights are more important than others because they may store more knowledge in the weights. Uh, and squeeze LM uses gradient to determine which values are more sensitive. Um, and they deem the parameters with higher gradient, gradient norm, as more important because uh, perturbing that parameters will lead to larger um, model accuracy loss. Um, so think of, think of it as, um, think of the ways as a human brain. And some parts of the human brain uh, controls thinking, reasoning, um, other parts controls like day-to-day -day functions, right? And because large language model is used for reasoning and um, problem solving, uh, some parts of it is more important towards certain tasks. So they are more sensitive. Um, let me know if that answers the question. It is clear to me. There is a follow-up question. So, yes. So the only uh, gradient is so, so, so only measurement of the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is the gradient then the only measurement of the sensitivity of a certain uh, weights? Um, so actually, I think different works use different measures of sensitivity. So in squeeze LM, they only use gradients as a measure of sensitivity. Uh, but if you take a look at other works, such as AWQ, what they use is the magnitude of the input vector. Uh, so if you look at the input vector, it has different channels, and some channels will have larger magnitude than others. Um, they will they will consider the channels correspond the the weights corresponding to a certain channel. If um, sorry, how do I put this? So they will consider the weights corresponding to an outlier channel as more important, because the outlier channel has larger input values. So perturbing the weights corresponding to it will lead to larger uh, difference in the model output. Uh, one, one, uh, con just a point uh, for you. Um, we didn't introduce the channel terminology in the course. So can you okay. tell us what the channel is for a language model like Llama? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, when you're running large language model inference, um, each token comes in one at a time, right? So in the large language model, we have the token dimension, which is the new token. Um, and then orthogonal to the token dimension is the channel dimension. So if you think about a matrix, 
we have the token dimension and we, as the columns, and then we have the channel dimension as the rows. Uh, so is the orthogonal dimension to the token dimension, uh, which is running across all the recent tokens. Is, is that clear? Yes. Okay. See some loading. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? There are no questions at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um. So let's now take a look at KV cache in large language models. Um, so the model ways can be considered the large language model's brain. And we can also consider KV cache as large language models short-term memory, uh, which are both very important towards thinking process in the large language model. I think here we can give an example of uh, of thinking about a large language model that is reading your prompt. And um, if you are giving it a prompt, it needs to remember what you have set so far. And that memory is encoded in the KV cache. Uh, but the model acquires knowledge in the pre-training, uh, such as uh, the history of the world, how the, how the world works. And those knowledge are stored in the model weights. And the prompt you passed it is the knowledge is storing the KB cache. Uh, so that's a side difference, side difference between the model weights and the KB cache. And by the way, we can quantize the model weights as well as the KB cache. Um, and we'll take a look at how that works. Um, so here is a short animation of uh, how attention works. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure how, how much Anna has introduced attention to you. So here's a short rundown. Uh, so what large language model uses is called self-attention. Uh, and each token attends to all the previous tokens in a large language model. Um, so here, what we are visualizing is the attention scores in a layer of attention inside a transformer. Uh, so how this works is that each token pays attention to all the other tokens, and uh, the attention score is different, uh, which it represents how much importance each token has to the other token. Uh, so we have a all-to-all -all relationship between the tokens, and uh, the, the attention score is very important for modeling language uh, and reasoning inside a large language model because that's how they think. Uh, so let's take a look at how attention is formulated. Um, if we denote the input matrix as X, uh, it is passed through three transformations, the query, the key, and the value transformation, um, which are three linear projections by WQ, WK, and WV. And we obtain the KQV matrix uh, from uh, the X matrix. And the KQV matrix uh, we then use to compute attention in the following manner. We compute the inner product between the query and the key, and we scale it by uh, the square root of dk, which is the dimensionality of the uh, query or the key. And then we do a softmax over the attention score, um, and then we use the attention score to do a weighted sum over the V matrix, uh, which is the final attention output. Uh, so here is an illustration of KV cache. Uh, when a query comes in, uh, when a query comes in, it says only one token, but it needs to attend to all the previous tokens. So that's why you need all the previous K cache and V cache. Um, so when a new token comes in, it is transformed into a query, a key, and a value. Uh, and the new key and the new value are appended to the previous K cache and V cache. Uh, but we don't have a Q cache because the query is only one vector. Um, and uh, the query, we use the query 
to do an inner product with the all the previous keys or the previous case and compute the attention score. And we use the attention score times uh, the values and that gives us the final attention output. So I hope this makes it clear that we need to store all the keys and the values uh, from the previous tokens, but we don't need a Q cache for the previous tokens. So this is actually quite expensive uh, to store the KV cache inside your GPU. Uh, on the right here, we have a figure that shows a memory breakdown of uh, a A140 gigabyte GPU. So if you want to run a Llama 13B, uh, 26 gigabytes is dedicated towards storing the model parameters or the model weights. Uh, and 30% of the GPU memory is dedicated just to the KV cache. And the uh, KV cache scales linearly with the number of layers, the hidden dimension, the batch size, and the number of tokens. So as you scale up the model size and as you uh, ingest more and more tokens, your KV cache scales linearly, uh, making it more and more uh, memory consuming. At one point, you'll, you'll probably run out of GPU memory and not be able to run inference anymore. So it is very important to compress the size of the KV cache in order for more efficient inference and inference of uh, longer context length and more users. Um, so there are two dimensions that you can quantize KV cache in, which is the token dimension and the channel dimension. Uh, so think of a KV cache as a matrix uh, a matrix of two dimensions, the rows and the columns. And when a token comes in, it, it becomes a new column. Um, and what usually people do is they quantize the KV cache along the token dimension. Um, however, there is a orthogonal uh, direction that you can consider, which is the channel dimension, um, which is considered in some of the recent works such as Kiwi, uh, this is a great paper for quantizing KV cache. I also recommend checking it out. Um, let me know if there's any questions so far. Any questions? Nope, seems like things are clear. Cool. Um, oh, by the way, we have talked about groupwise quantization, groupwise affine quantization, or groupwise linear quantization. And that is also how it is done for KV cache. So you take a group of activations and you determine the scaling factor and the zero point for the group of activations. And then you quantize the floating point numbers into integer format. And then during inference, when you want to uh, actually do the matrix multiplication, you dequantize the integer numbers back into the floating point format, and then you run inference by doing the matrix multiplications. Okay, so let's talk about a critical insight, um, which is the existence of outliers in the channel dimension, which is proposed in Kiwi um, in ICML this year. So, these authors, they're taking a look at the distributions of the KV cache values. And they have found that um, in the key cache, there is outlier, there's the existence of outlier channels. Uh, so I have a uh, box, the K cache in the red boxes. So here, here, and here. Um, and you will observe a distinct pattern in these K cache, which is there are certain channels, certain channels running across, uh, running across from left to right. Uh, certain channels, they have much larger magnitude than other channels. Um, this is a very critical observation in large language models because um, these channels, they affect the quantization uh, loss of precision very significantly. And if you take, at the, take a look at the blue boxes, 
um, which is the value cache, you observe no such pattern. Um, so there's a distinct difference between the key cache and the value cache, which is the existence of the outliers in the channel dimension. So on the, on the left here, we have uh, summarized key cache. There are a few channels that have large magnitude or what we call the outliers. And in the value cache, there's no, no such outlier patterns. So what Kiwi is proposing is that we should quantize the key cache per channel while quantizing the value cache per token. Um, this is because if you, if you record the zero point and scaling factor across the token dimension for key cache, what we'll find out is that um, it doesn't, uh, because the values are not evenly distributed on the number line, you are wasting a lot of information uh, you're wasting a lot of quantized values that are unrepresented. Um, it's only the min and the max that are represented by uh, these activations. But if you if you record the zero point in the scaling factor across the channel dimension, because there's much less variance across the activations, you can represent these values to a much higher precision than you would otherwise get if you quantize them per token. Uh, here's an illustration just to emphasize this point. So if you do per channel quantization, you are quantizing across the channels and recording the zero point scaling factor. But if you are doing per token quantization, you are recording the zero point, uh, zero point in scaling factor across the new token. So it is obviously more efficient to quantize uh, per channel for the keys and per tokens for the values. However, this approach will give us one challenge um, that is not very intuitive to solve, which is per channel quantization, um, in per channel quantization, the scaling factor and the zero point are calculated for a group of activations in the KB cache along the channel dimension uh, the challenge is how do we determine the scaling factor and zero point for the current group if the next tokens are not known yet? Uh, because remember, the tokens are coming in one by one in larger than model inference, and the current group of activations are not, are not, have not come in yet. So we cannot determine the scaling point, uh, the scaling factor and the zero point. So the Kiwi's author, what they propose is they keep a fixed number of recent tokens in full position, which they call the residual cache. And they only quantize once the resi residual cache fills up to the group size. Um, so once the residual cache fills up to the group size, what that means is that we can now determine the scale, scaling factor and zero point for the current group. And now we can quantize the activations without, without problem. Uh, so here we're showing an illustration of how that works. Uh, this is a paper in COLM of this year uh, called SK, SKVQ. I uh, also recommend checking this out. It is a direct follow-up of the Kiwi paper. And what they are proposing is in addition to the recent tokens, they also keep the attention sync, which is the first few tokens also in full position because that helps you to preserve the model quality even further. Uh, so at each step, we are quantizing, uh, sorry, we are keeping the recent tokens in full position, which is in yellow, uh, sorry, in blue. Uh, we are also keeping the first few tokens, which is the attention sync also in full position. Um, but we are keeping all the other tokens quantized to save memory. Uh, so the quantized tokens are in red and the full position tokens are in green here. Um, that's why, that's how we do per channel quantization for the keys and also enable very memory efficient inference for large language models in terms of KV cache. So let's take a look at the experimental results of KV, KV cache quantization. Um, 
TV is a combination of uh, per channel key quantization with residual cache. Um, and the takeaway here is that it preserves model performance much better compared to quantizing it per token or quantizing value per channel or not using the residual cache at all. Um, so if you compare the numbers, uh, you'll see that the performance is really, really close to the full precision KV cache. Uh, please let me know if there's any questions so far. Is KV foreign to referring to four bits and two bits? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, do you have intuition? I'm looking at truthful QA, two bits being having higher performance than four bit version. Mm. And I guess for all the uh, other data sets for Lama 2, 7 billion, is that the standard observation that I, I personally expected that four bit will work better? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So um, I think for truthful QA, it's a, um, a data set that evaluates the trustworthiness or the safety of the language model. It's not evaluating its performance or knowledge on a certain task. Um, so the usual pattern on truthful QA is that a model with worse quality will have higher score on this data set. Um, but it only holds up for slightly worse quality, right? So if your model has completely collapsed in quality, it's going to go to zero in terms of accuracy. But if your model has slightly worse quality, uh, the score may actually increase for truthful QA because it's not testing the reasoning skills or the knowledge of the language model. It's testing its trustworthiness. And uh, um, slightly perturbed outputs may have higher score on truthful QA on this data set alone. So this data set may not be the most representative when it comes to evaluating model's performance. Um, and the COQA and GSM 8K may be more reflective or how, how well the model actually performs. Got it. Um, another question I have is, is 16-bit like a full model? That's like our standard model, or is that also quantized from 32 to 16? That is the full model. Um, yeah, so large language models usually use 16-bit activations and weights, um, as opposed to like earlier models such as ResNet or UNet or BERT, which use 32-bit activation and weights. Uh, because memory is very, um, these large language models are very hungry in terms of uh, GPU memory consumption. Um, so what uh, current researchers do, they train the models in 16-bit uh, precision, which has a comparable performance as a 32-bit model, and which is twice as memory efficient as 32-bit model. So uh, that's the that's the uh, current practice of large language models. Got it. Other questions about the uh, cache quantization? Was that clear? What are we doing there? Should we need to go over certain things again? I got one. Uh, yes, you can go go ahead. I guess. Um, so okay. It's not clear. Okay. Okay, uh, so lastly, I'm going to talk about one of my recent works uh, that has been uh, accepted in NURBS. Um, what we are doing is a step further uh, in quantizing KV cache uh, based on a very important observation that KV cache channels are highly correlated. Um, so I recommend checking out this paper, KV cache is one bit per channel, efficient logic model inference with couple quantization, uh, which is my paper and just recently accepted. It's based on a very important observation that the KV cache quantization, sorry, the KV cache channels are sharing a lot of mutual information or they can be thought of as uh, having high correlations. Um, here we are showing the heat map for correlations, for the correlation matrices of uh, keys and values in LAMA 7B model. Um, as you can see here, uh, 
um, in certain layers, there is very significant correlation between some of the channels, uh, which is which is a very important observation and pretty useful for quantizing KV cache because we will see how this can be useful. Um, so a very briefly, so information theory tells us the joint entropy of multiple sources of signals, uh, in this case, the signals being the KV cache channels, um, the joint entropy is going to be less or equal to the sum of their marginal entropies. So how this is useful to us is that uh, entropy tells you how many bits of it, how many bits of the information you need to quantize a certain source of information. And by considering their marginal entropies, you are thinking uh, in terms of quantizing each channels independently. But if you if you quantize the channels together, you are just encoding its joint entropy, which may be much less than their, uh, the sum of their marginal entropies. And here on the right, what we are showing is a comparison of the marginal entropy and joint entropy. Um, and for KV cache, because the joint entropy is much less than the sum of their marginal entropies, it is more efficient to encode these channels in a joint manner. So that's why we are proposing uh, what's called couple quantization. Uh, before diving into the method, let's give a very informal example of why this works. Uh, so think of two channels, channel one and channel two, and we are trying to encode the values or quantize the values. Um, so if we take a look at the values of channel one, uh, which range from zero to 15, uh, encoding channel one will require four bits at least. Um, and then if you take a look at channel two, channel two also require four bit of information. But if you look really closely, channel one and channel two, they are exactly the same. So this is perfect correlation. Uh, so if you want to encode them together, you will only require four bits for both channels as opposed to eight bits for encoding these channels uh, separately. Um, so that's like the intuition be behind our method, uh, which is because these channels have high correlation, we can encode them together to save on the amount of information we need to achieve a certain accuracy. Um, so on the left here, we have channel-wise quantization, which is done by existing methods. Um, and the blue points are the uh, values in the KV cache. And because it has this distinct shape, per channel quantization doesn't really capture the value well. And you will lead to very high quantization error, which is uh, 600, around 600 in this case. And on the right, we have our method, which is couple quantization. And we consider uh, the relationship between the channels and we jointly encode them to, in order to achieve much lower quantization error. In this case, it's only 250. Uh, so our results show that if you increase the number of channels that you uh, couple, uh, you are approaching the quality of uh, the unquantized model very quickly. So if you quantize, uh, if you quantize eight channels together uh, with eight bits, which is one bit quantization, you are approaching the performance of uh, the full, the full unquantized model. Um, and in this case, complexity is lower or better. So by going lower, we are approaching the full model performance. And on the right, we also have to perplexity values uh, for a comparison with some of the existing best methods. Um, as we can see, it consistently achieves the best perplexity values uh, against the baselines. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. No questions. Okay. Uh, with that, um, I will conclude my talk with a recap. Uh, so we have taken a look at 
uniform and non-uniform quantization. We have taken a look at the KV caching mechanism, and we have also reviewed some of the state-of-the-art KV cache quantization methods. Um, I hope that's useful or interesting to you. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and uh, a sincere thank you to Professor Anna for the invitation, and thank you all for listening. Please feel free to reach out to me, and I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, let's thank you. Okay. Are there any questions, maybe more broader questions uh, about, for example, I will start. Uh, maybe can you tell us what are your, I don't know, insights into what are the major areas um, that people will work on in the future for quantization? It seems like there is still uh, room for improvement in terms of the, for example, errors you were showing us, so that they are way lower, three times lower than they were before. There seems to still be um, error that's happening. And I guess my question is, what do you envision as important directions for the community to take to lower those uh, error values? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So um, when you're quantizing the uh, waste or the KV cache, you're always dealing with some sort of errors uh, because of loss of precision. Um, so it's also always an open research question how to preserve the model quality when you're quantizing down to two bits or one bit. Um, and also an open question would be how to run inference very efficiently with these quantization methods because there is certain quantization and dequantization overhead in inference. So how do you make the process, inference process more efficient when you are running a quantized model? Uh, it's also a very important research question. Um, and some you can also combine quantization with some existing known methods, such as pruning, sparsity, uh, token eviction. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, so sparse GPT, which is a, a pretty powerful method for pruning, shows that you can prune 50% of the model weights uh, meaning that you can set uh, half of the model weights to zero and still retain the model performance uh, reasonably. So one way you can do is that you can quantize, uh, you can prune 50% of the model weights and then you can quantize the rest of the model weights to make the model even more efficient and um, use less memory. Um, in terms of KV cache, what people have shown that is that you can drop some of the tokens uh, altogether. You can forget some of the unimportant tokens. For example, uh, if you have a sentence, um, today is very cold. Uh, if you remove the word the and remove the word is, uh, it doesn't affect the meaning of the sentence very much. Um, and you would end up with 50% of the tokens as you originally had. So that also conserves memory even further. And you can combine these sparsity-based methods along with quantization to achieve more compression, uh, which in turn leads to better GPU memory efficiency. Thank you. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Uh, let me just read it. Uh, did the last slide bolded values show an increase in perplexity compared to the floating point representation? I didn't fully understand that. Uh, yes. So if you um, if you look closely, we're comparing um, we're comparing the values of perplexity within a group. So uh, we're comparing the four bit quantization and two bit quantization, one bit quantization. Uh, we are not directly comparing against the FB16 values because there's always an increase compared to the FB16. Uh, but I guess even for one bit, the increase is not too much. Uh, so the bold values is only for um, the same bit width, under the same bit width. We're not comparing uh, the four bit against the 16 bit. Got it. Okay. Uh, if that wasn't 
a clear slater, please let us know. Any other questions? All right, that seems to be it. Let's thank Yangin one more time.